So here we go. It's a, again, Andrew King here, editor in chief of Canadian Musician. This is how SoCan gets you paid, the latest free webinar from NWC Webinars and Canadian Musician Magazine. Joining us for the presentation this evening, Aidan Dau and Melissa Cameron Pasley, two of SoCan's A&R representatives. Uh, before coming to SoCan, Aidan was an A&R rep with Warner, Warner Chapel Music Canada, and uh, Melissa has experience having worked with UTA, um, I guess now defunct, but uh, on the live side of the business, which is very cool because uh, both of their backgrounds have streams that lead directly to SoCan's activities, as we will talk about this evening. And uh, again, my name is Andrew, thrilled to have you here. Uh, Aiden, Melissa, thanks for being so patient, and it's a privilege having you guys join us. Thank you for having us. So happy to be here, thank you. Awesome. Okay. So, um, yeah, folks, as we go here, we're going to open up for questions about halfway through. You can feel free to submit your question at any point in the, the text window provided there. Uh, I'll be going through those and fielding them. We'll put them in front of Aiden and Melissa uh, partway through the session. We'll take some questions then, especially ones that pertain to things that we've talked about in the first half of the presentation. If we don't get to your question, then fret not because we've got a longer uh, Q&A at the end will be more wide-reaching. Anything you guys want to ask, we can put it in front of our experts here. Um, so yeah, just to slowly ease our way into this here, um, you're a musician or a songwriter. Uh, the main sources of income for artists, for creators, uh, just a quick outline here. Um, so there's your gig fees and commissions, what you're being paid to perform or to appear places, merchandise sales, and that includes sale of your music, which uh, as much as we don't like to hear it sometimes, your art is indeed a product, uh, but there are other items that go in with that. And then the big one that pertains to us this evening is the licensing of copyrights, when your songs, when your intellectual property are being used or exploited by others. And um, yeah, this is our jump off point here. Uh, Aiden, Melissa, did you guys have anything that you want to uh, introduce us to about any of these three checks before we jump into SoCan 101? Um, yeah, I just want to point out that um, everybody should always remember that these th three things are separate and um, we get a lot of questions about, um, you know, uh, they're like, oh, well, like there might be musicians that say, oh, I got, um, I got paid to play, so, you know, that's good, I'm, I'm good now. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't be getting the money on the back end as well if you're the one writing the song. So just to keep in mind that all of all of those different avenues of making money are separate things and you can be collecting all of them if you are a part of all of them. Oh, bang on. Um, so here we go. Uh, with regards to copyright, and this is, well, I guess uh, one of these is the side that uh, where SoCan's going to come in here. Um, but front end and back end, can you walk us through the differences between these two and maybe some general examples of um, what applies, like different scenarios or applications that apply to each of these? Yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so as you mentioned, SoCan is the back end, right? So we're the ones that are, once your, your song is getting placed on, um, let's just say, for example, um, you get a, a song placed in um, a television show and um, it's a music supervisor that placed it. Um, there's going to be generally an upfront agreement um, where you're signing a deal memo to start with and then a full length memo um, or full length agreement um, following that. And there will be two sides of payment upfront. So that will be um, a sync fee and a master use fee. So that is something separate. SoCan has nothing to do with that money that's getting paid out. Um, where we kick in is when um, when the performance royalties start coming in through the airing of the show. So once it starts hitting um, cable television, for example, um, uh, from the air date nine months later is when you're going to be seeing those royalties coming in through SoCan. Right on. Um, so yeah, we're going to do a quick uh, breakdown of SOCAN as an organization, then we're going to get more specifically into the different uh, ways that SOCAN collects royalties, uh, the various, well, everything under that umbrella. Um, we said we were going to help you maximize your revenue and get every cent you're entitled to through uh, these fine folks, and uh, that's coming up very shortly. But just to give us an overview of the organization, um, yeah, Aiden, did you want to walk us through some of these points here and just provide a bit of background? Yeah, 100%. Uh, so, like you're saying, can, uh, SOCAN is Canada's performing rights organization. We're Canada's only performing rights organization as well. 
And we have about 150,000 members from across all genres and all types of music. Uh, everyone from uh, emerging green songwriters that haven't really published a whole lot of music and, and, and releasing music to the, the big players like Drake and The Weeknd and uh, all of those guys. Um, we were a PRO. Uh, we also uh, have a bunch of members that are our publisher, our publisher members, rather, as well. Uh, are we? The, I believe we're the only or one of the only few PROs that have uh, publishers as their members as well, correct? Yeah, I believe so. Um, uh, yeah, so so we, we we work in in tandem as well with them as well. We we they have obviously different needs than than uh, unsigned and unpublished members, but uh, we work with them quite a bit. And we're not we're not for profit as well. So uh, the the music that's being recorded is owned and operated by the members themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as uh, like being the only Canada's only PRO, as you say, uh, one question that I know is going to come up later, so maybe we can jump uh, nip it in the bud here. But what's the difference between SoCan and ReSound is the one that comes up most frequently. But then, if you can expand a bit, like some of the other ones that people might be familiar with, for example, say uh, M Rock or um, yeah, we have a bunch of friends on that side. But uh, let us know what's unique about SoCan. So um, the, all the, the companies that you're um, you're mentioning, everybody handles a different um, a different royalty stream. So mm -hmm. um, for SoCan, we're handling performing rights. Um, also, no, we're PRO. Uh, you'll often hear that term, um, which stands for performing rights organization. So we're collecting um, uh, your royalties that are being performed, which can be kind of a uh, confusing term sometimes. Because um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you're performing it live always, right? A performance can also be a um, radio play or um, an AV, audiovisual, um, where music is to screen, to picture. Um, so that was kind of the performance. Any kind of um, royalty that we're collecting, or sorry, any kind of performance that we're collecting, uh, we refer to it as a performance. So I just wanted to put that out there so there's no confusion. Um, so anyway, so the difference, um, there's um, something called neighboring rights, um, which is also a stream of royalties that you can um, collect. So you can sign up for MROC for that, or you can sign up through Acturac. They both do the same thing. Um, and ReSound is um, the company that licenses venues, um, and, and uh, sorry, not venues, licenses their, um, their tariffs and get that money in to be paid out by MROC or um, uh, Acturac. So neighboring rights um, isn't handling the royalties for the songwriters or the publishers. They're handling royalties for the performers on the song. Again, there's another term performers in a different uh, in a different definition. So I know that's confusing, but performers as in like you could be a session player, you could be a hand clapper on a record, you could uh, be playing anything when you're, you could be uh, a producer that is like playing with programs, tracks, right? So you're actually mm -hmm. performing on the record. Um, you could be the singer of your own record and you can be getting neighboring rights and you can be getting SOCAN royalties as well if you're writing the song. So um, all in all, and there's more, there's more streams of royalties that, you know, we won't get into. Um, it's not something that we handle, but um, just definitely sign up for all of these different um, collectives because all of this money adds up um, and you can be, or you should be collecting from all these different streams. Mm -hmm. All right, on. Um, now's as good a time as any to direct people. I was just going to go to socan.ca. Uh, the website is very comprehensive and uh, there's a very good about us section, um, tons of FAQs, but we want to direct you to socan.ca slash join hyphen socan. Uh, this is really step one. Uh, it's totally free. Aiden or Melissa, give us an idea though, uh, how long does it take to actually become a member of SOCAN? And then I know we're, we're reaching a bit into the future, but um, like how often does someone need to, I guess, maintain their membership profile? Uh, basically, how long are you spending kind of in the back end managing your business? Yeah, sure. So, so registration with SOCAN is incredibly easy. Like you're saying, it's free. It uh, just takes a few minutes for the first step of things. Uh, you'll see the web portal when, when you go to, uh, visit that hyperlink there. Um, 
it's almost I, I like to equate it it's, it's as easy as joining up for Facebook the, initially you just fill out your information and, and you create a user ID and a password and you'll get a uh, PDF file back to you that you have to sign you can e-sign it or print it out the old-fashioned way and sign it that way um, and then you just return it back to us and it takes about three days or so for you to get your, your membership profile completed um, and then you can go from there and as far as uh, maintaining your, your profile um, I would say any anytime you're, you're writing songs and performing it in shows um, just to, to go into your profile and, and keep it up to date with your, your registrations that way so um, I think it's kind of a fluid thing like to always have like you know create a bookmark and, and have it uh, on your laptop or your, your desktop computer just so you can for easy access um, I, I like to you know become familiar with it I like to think it, it's like another arm of your of your uh, your bookmarks to utilize as much as you can and get familiar with it as much as you can as well bang on all right um, so here we go very abstract imagery here I'm gonna let uh, Melissa and Aiden kind of take this over uh, we're gonna walk through a couple more slides here then we'll go to our first question period and then in the second half we're gonna get into the dollars and cents literally give you an idea of the different uh, ways or the different means that SOCAN is paying royalties to its members uh, and even a little bit about some of the dollar values associated with that to give you a rough idea um, but here we are yeah focusing on SOCAN so as we mentioned mentioned a not-for-profit uh, member owned why don't you guys take it over here sure um, sorry did you, did you want us to, to talk about the points on the screen at the moment please do yeah okay um, so yeah we are a member owned uh, non-profit company um, so um, that's pretty self-explanatory I'd say um, operationally focused um, we have you know over 300 staff members that are running this operation. Um, I was actually surprised when I first um, stepped foot in, in the building my first time many years ago. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people um, get their quarterly payments, but actually don't know kind of um, who's behind it kind of thing. So um, uh, anyways, I'll get more into in, into the departments and stuff, uh, or we can do that now. Do you want me to talk about the breakdown of the departments and stuff? Actually, now's as good of a time as any. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a background on what Aiden and I do. Um, we're in the membership department. Um, we work on the A and R team. We're A and R representatives in Toronto. Um, our department is fairly new. Um, the membership department is not new, but our A and R team is quite new. Um, and um, it was uh, developed um, about four or five years ago now. I say um, when Mike McCarty came in um, and took over the membership department um, and they realized that there was a need for um, you know like outreach and people on the ground um, uh, us scouring the web for um, new up-and-comers and you know to educate young writers about what we do um, so they developed this team it's not traditional A&R from like a label perspective it's um, kind of a new a new performing rights one <laughs> um, so our day-to-day -day ranges um, from day-to-day. -day. It's definitely not a same thing every day kind of, kind of gig. Um, but our goals of our team are to recruit, um, retain, and repatriate. So we want to make sure that um, we're educating young writers um, on what we do. That's our, mm -hmm. one of our big goals, obviously. And um, we want to make sure that, um, that we're keeping people happy. So we want to create opportunities for writers to connect with others um, and further their goals within their career so that we can see them succeed. Um, and we want to keep Canadians with the Canadian company. So that is our main objective. We also do um, um, a lot of other projects in terms of sponsorship. You know, we work with Canadian Music Week, um, East Coast Music Awards, Breakout West, things like this. Mm -hmm. um, we facilitate song camps and other, um, uh, and other outreach programs to build people's connections and whatnot um, and and lots of other things so and, and, and like Melissa was mentioning as well we we have a fairly large office in Toronto it's about 300 employees but we also have branch offices in Vancouver and Montreal as well and and those offices have uh, in our counterpoints our counterparts rather um, mm -hmm. in them as well that, that do the same thing that we do yep and we'll be opening an office I don't know if this is probably news to a lot of people we're opening an office in LA next month um, will be a grand opening at the end of the month where we will have um, 
a new A and R um, hired out there, and um, we will have a, a studio to work out of there as well. So we're expanding. Oh wow, that's an exciting yeah, anyways, time. I just talked about the team. I didn't talk about the rest of everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's our team. <laughs> um, well, that's and of a course, we have a full licensing department who are working on collecting the royalties for the writers and publishers. Um, we have distribution. We have lawyers. We have um, royalty trackers, account executives, information officers, and so on and so on. So it, it is a big operation. Mm -hmm. um, we can get to the future-oriented part here uh, is something that we'll jump into afterwards and talk about some of the other initiatives that uh, in which SOCAN has a hand. Um, but then, yeah, here, what rights holders want. Now, rights holders obviously being SOCAN members and the being a not-for-profit, uh, being owned and operated by the members, ultimately it's a self-fulfilling, never-ending cycle that uh, you want to run lean, you want to be servicing the people whose interests you're representing. Uh, so here we go, we've got these four points in front of us. Can you give us a rough idea as to some of the different ways that SOCAN is working towards giving its right holders uh, these various wants? Yeah, so... Um... So in terms of transparency, um, we do an annual report um, that is available um, for the public to check out um, at the, you know, to, to see how the year, the year that passed went. Um, and you can check this out on the website. Um, it gives you, you know, lots of information there. So we're being very transparent about what kind of money is getting collected and distributed and whatnot. So I definitely um, uh, advise anybody to go check that out just so they can understand how, um, how things are going and where we're at. Um, in terms of lower costs, um, so our our members, um, if let's say we have a, a SOCAN member, um, we're, we're representing them for the world, so um, we are licensing and collecting royalties within Canada, our team, our licensing team handles that, um, but outside of Canada, in other territories, we have reciprocal agreements with um, other performing rights organizations around the world, so we're working with them um, to collect royalties for performances that you're getting outside of Canada. So we're getting that money coming in um, to us and then we're paying it out to the writers. So what we receive, we pay out. We don't take an administration fee on top of international money coming in. Um, so we always like to point that out that that's a benefit to our writers. Um, you know, say you get a big hit out in, um, in the UK, um, whatever you're making out in the UK is gonna go directly to you. We're gonna we're going to send it directly to you, but we're not going to take any money off the top. So you're making more money at SOCAN. Hmm. Um, and what about on the side of cost? I mean, that transparency report, or the sorry, complete annual report that you mentioned there, um, which we've got some figures from the 2017 year uh, coming up here shortly. Uh, but yeah, as far as, as lowering operational costs, um, you mentioned it's a very big organization, hundreds of employees. What are some of the ways that you've been working towards that goal in recent years as you, I guess, look to lower costs, but then are also being future oriented, making investments and strategic decisions uh, for the future? Um, are you talking about like other um, like partners that we're launching and, and stuff like that? Or just like operationally, uh, for example, I think it's in 2017 had revenues of over uh, 350 million for the first time, which is an impressive number. And that mm -hmm. about it was over, I think, 300 million that gets uh, distributed. So the rest of that, I mean, again, with hundreds of employees, uh, operational costs are definitely there. What are some of the other activities, though, that um, that SOCAN is funding with that gross revenue? And, and how does it fit into the best interests of your membership? Um, we, do, we do also have the... Uh, it's a separate arm of SOCAN, but it's internal. It's, it's called the SOCAN Foundation, and, and yeah, that's, uh, that's that's a part of the organization that is really um, servicing emerging uh, songwriters and, and greener talent. Um, they 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 initiated a couple of new grants recently. Um, there's three of them right now. There's the travel grant. Um, there is the works commission grant, and there's a, a an artist development grant that's geared towards young composers. Mm -hmm. um, and these are fairly utilized tools from uh, a lot of emerging uh, members that we have in, in our system. Uh, the, the travel grant, I'll just give you a brief breakdown uh, on these particular grants. The, the travel grants 
probably our most popular one. Um, basically, it's it's uh, it's up to a thousand dollars for a member you can apply for, um, and that's based on distance. So we we gauge the, the amount allotted to the member just based on the distance of their travel. So if they're planning to go to LA for a songwriting session, or if they have a label meeting or a publisher meeting. Uh, we would allot them up to a thousand dollars, depending on how far the stay is. Um, I would say if somebody's planning to utilize it for a tour, if they have a run of shows somewhere, uh, always select the furthest date possible, just so you can capitalize on on the amount of grant money there. And and just to jump in there, um, I, I do think um, when they're vetting the um, the applications that um, that they're looking at, they're they're more likely to be funding um, non paid gigs. So um, showcases are a good thing to go for mm -hmm. meetings writing sessions and stuff like that so if you are making a significant mm -hmm. amount of income on um, a tour or something like that it, you might not be getting it kind of thing mm -hmm. but um, anyways so we that is run by the Spokane Foundation um, mm -hmm. just to point that out it is two separate things so if you are interested in, um, in learning more about that definitely check out the Spokane Foundation yeah. page um, um, and they're doing a lot so I mean we work with them all the time to help out we tell people about the foundation all the time as yeah. well. And, and as Melissa was mentioning earlier too, we do a lot of sponsored um, events and sponsored um, initiatives as well. So mm -hmm. uh, she, was, she was mentioning earlier that we, we partner with East West Music Awards and, and great song camps. And, and then so so if you're if you're asking, correct me if you're wrong, where, where the rest of the um, that funding would go, it would go to initiatives like that with the foundation and, the, um, and, and sponsorships as well. Bang on. That's exactly what I was going for is uh, just that idea of continually reinvesting in the membership. Um, what were the R's again? It fits into that to uh, remember oh, repatriate uh, being the third. Yeah, yeah. Recruitment, um, repatriation, and uh, retaining. Bingo. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, different wheels of the machine working together. Uh, is there anything else on lower costs, more control, transparency? higher revenues, uh, anything else to touch on before we jump into questions? And there are some great ones here, actually. Um, no, I, I think we'll just jump into questions and, you know, you can ask us what there's, if you want us to dive deeper in. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, We'll open up for a wider Q&A at the end here, uh, but there are some great ones. We really appreciate the engagement, folks. Um, so first off, Aiden and Melissa, uh, someone here is a member of BMI, which uh, just to clarify, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and I believe Sound Exchange are the four main PROs in the United States. And as we've heard, uh, like SOCAN essentially works with them to get its members paid and vice versa. So if someone's a member of one of the American PROs, can they slash should they also be members of SOCAN? Um, yeah, so uh, just just to um, make note, um, CSAC is, is the third one that I think you're referring to. So um, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are the ones that um, that we work with. Um, uh -huh. um, and, um, so, so just to make sure I got the question right, so there's somebody who is a member of BMI and they're wondering if they should sign up for SOCAN as well? Right. Okay, so um, if BMI is representing you for the world at the moment, then um, you would have to request to um, to change one of your territories to go direct to SOCAN. Um, so um, first question would be, are you a Canadian? Can you get an answer from them right now, or does that it, it does it not happen in real time? Just, just yeah, we uh, totally can. Uh, yeah, yeah okay. a, a Canadian down in the states. Yeah. Okay, so for sure. So. You should be a SOCAN member. You're Canadian. We want to make sure that we're representing all the Canadians everywhere. So um, what I would suggest is um, you can become a SOCAN member for the world and have your affiliate as BMI, which um, allows you to, um, to access all of the benefits that they may have um, and the support that they'd be offering. Um, however, we'd be administering um, you know, your royalties and you'd be registering all of your songs and submitting all of your concerts, which we'll get into in a bit, um, uh, through us. Um, and we'd be the BMI would be licensing your work in the States um, and sending it to us to administer and send to you. Bingo. So long story short, you need to, um, you can't be a member of more than one PRO if you're getting represented worldwide by BMI. 
Awesome. Um, so yeah, I had mentioned BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, and Sound Exchange in the same breath. Uh, just to clarify, though, um, the first three, CSAC, ASCAP, and BMI, are PROs basically like SoCan's American counterpart. Sound Exchange is a digital uh, PRO and operates a little bit differently. We won't jump into that, but um, I misspoke and grouped them together. That was my mistake. And if you're interested in what Sound Exchange does, uh, you can check out soundexchange.com. Anyway, jumping back into some of these great questions. Um, I guess this one will be a pretty easy yes or no. Uh, when we were talking about all of the different organizations, particularly the Canadian ones that represent different uh, licenses, do you know of a resource anywhere, a good one that you pointed people to before that gives a really definitive, maybe visual kind of map of just who does what? Um, like one website kind of thing that has like a nice... Uh, yeah, kind of or, or resource that you point people to. I, I realize it might have been a long shot, but that is a, a great question, Valerie. Um, I don't know of one, but I was speaking with somebody um, the other day um, at a conference and we were talking about how there should be one. So, uh, <laughs> and actually our conversation was that she had made one um, not that long ago and is going to share it with me. So I will uh, see if that can, you know, maybe be integrated into one of our websites or, you know, somewhere because there should be for sure. It's confusing to, um, to you know, not know where to go um, for the different royalty streams we do have faqs on our website um, it's not an actual visual map but we do have um we do have answers on uh, that direct you to the right um the right organizations to go to for the various um royalty streams so oh, right on yeah i guess we as canadian musician could step to the plate for that one too so uh we will be back to you um let's see here Okay, we'll get to that one a bit later on. Um, yeah, as far as signing up and becoming a member, can a manager or a representative set up an account for an artist and maintain their profile uh, and maybe beyond that, like, is that something that is commonplace? Do you recommend it, et cetera? Yeah, that's, uh, that's called an authorized rep and there is a form on the website. I would recommend the member has to sign up first uh, if the songwriter is signing up. Um, there is a form once they get into their profile, uh, there's a whole tab of forms, but once they get into their profile, uh, there is a form called an authorized rep form and whoever they're intending to have as a manager or as a representative will have to uh, sign that as well. Um, and once you send that back in, we, we handle that on our end and confirm that. And once it's confirmed, uh, the manager or the, the rep can uh, activate and use the, the account um, uh, on their own time, on their own computer, and manage registrations and things like that. So it is something that can be done, and, and I do recommend that if, if you do have a manager, lucky enough to have a manager um, who's going to be able to do those things like registrations. Mm -hmm. And if you are underage, um, you can still sign up. Um, you just have to have a guardian uh, sign off on the form with you, and um, they would become your authorized rep as well. Right on. Okay, awesome. Uh, Byron Pasco, Edwards PC Creative Law, Ottawa and Toronto, one of our heroes. Uh, Byron is on the session tonight. And as far as that chart, uh, connectmusic.ca slash licensing.aspx. Check that out. Uh, he's recommending it. So I'm just going to throw it out there without having checked it out myself. Um, also, edwardslaw.ca slash soundexchange and edwardslaw.ca slash SOCAN uh, for some general information about those associations and what they do. Thank you very much, Byron. Um, yeah, a couple more here and then we'll jump in the rest of the presentation. If we didn't get to your question, we will uh, look to get to it at the end. We're keeping this one to the 60 minutes too, so I will hurry up. Um, Aiden, Melissa, do so can NLMPs, which again, to be clear, a notification of live music performance, I guess we'll be covering that shortly, uh, but really quickly, do they cover original works performed on cruise ships? Interesting. Ooh. Um, I've never actually never had that question before. That's a good question. Um, I am going to have to say they don't, um, but I can confirm that with our concerts department. Um, and the reason that they don't is because um, a cruise ship would be fall under um, a different kind of a tariff. It would be like a general licensing tariff. Um, 
I don't know what sheriff it is for sure because we don't work in the licensing department. But um, and, and the reason being is because when you submit your your set list, um, the rule is it has to be six dollars or more charged at the door in order for that um, NLMP to uh, kick in. So, um, well, if you are going to a restaurant to have dinner and um, there's um, maybe a trio playing at the restaurant. Um, your purpose of going into the restaurant is to have dinner and the added enjoyment to your evening is the music. Um, so your main purpose was not to go see the person perform um, at the restaurant. Um, that wouldn't fall under the same kind of a licensing fee. Um, and those people performing their original songs wouldn't, wouldn't be able to submit a set list for that. Um, now, if you're going to you know, a big music festival and you're buying a ticket to see your favorite artist, Something like that would generally fall under um, under one of our our concert tariffs, where um, we'd be collecting three percent of box office receipts that goes out and gets paid to um, the writers and publishers of the songs. Mm -hmm. So, long story short, cruise ship, um, in my opinion, I, again, never had that question asked, but I, I don't think that it would fall under that kind of a tariff. Ten four. Uh, this and any other questions, if you have follow up or we for any reason don't get to it, uh, a king at nor com, a k i n g at nor com is my email. Hit me up and I will make sure you get the answer you need, whether it's from Melissa and or Aiden or elsewhere. Uh, but let's keep rolling here. Uh, yeah, we talked about some of the these figures earlier, and uh, again, I called these from. Um, Actually, I don't think it was the full 2017 report, but rather a little bit of a preview. Uh, but I'll let you guys toot the horn here. Uh, can you walk us through some of these figures? Uh, new records, there's a few new records here. Uh, SoCan's had some really impressive year-over-year -year growth for, geez, as far back as I can remember, maybe a decade or mm -hmm. so. Um, but yeah, walk us through these and uh, maybe throw some uh, background in there about the significance. Yeah, I mean, um, you see the numbers. We're we're doing really well these days, you know, and and mainly it's because of our our members. Um, we are um, we have global repertoire now. You know, we're um, Toronto specifically is 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 killing it these days in the um, in in the writing and uh, publishing world, and um, it's super exciting to see. So we have you know, the Drakes, the Weeknd, Alessia Cara, um, Sean Mendes, like all these mega superstars that are um, doing really well all around the world. And um, SoCan has um, uh, has been working for these people um, and working hard to make sure that they're getting paid what's owed to them. So um, the numbers listed here are, are proof of, of what's going on um, globally right now. Mm -hmm. This is great. Um yeah, royalties from non-Canadian sources of more than seventy-five million. This is actually me asking, uh, but as the number one revenue stream for SoCan members, what exactly does that mean? The royalties from non-Canadian sources. Um, well, and, and being okay. the number one revenue stream. Sorry, say that one more time. And and then being oh. the number one revenue stream. Right. So that's referring to our international money coming in, right? So. Um, so non-domestic performances. So coming in from around the world, like uh, okay. maybe the States or the UK, you know, money, money royalties that are coming in for our writers and publishers outside of Canada. Okay, bang on. Um, here, let's keep rolling then. Okay, I love this. Uh, I stole this graphic straight up from uh, SOCAN, but it's so relevant to what we're talking about here. Uh, this is something that we've chatted about recently, and I think it called it the Drake effect, or maybe it was the Drake ecosystem, but essentially how, I mean, you just mentioned some of the major stars that Canada's produced over the last few years. Um, but yeah, I really don't like the term trickle down effect or trickle down economics. Uh, because it's been so exploited or abused, but it applies perfectly to this. Uh, can you guys tell us what the Drake effect is and who some of these other fine artists and producers like The Weeknd to some of the behind the scenes guys like Forty and Boy Wanda and Francis Scott Heath, who just did the So Can Cook and Beat session at CMW. Uh, how do these all come into play with one another? Yeah, of course. Uh, so as you can see, uh, when there is uh, one global superstar as a member. Uh, there tends to be a lot of other successful members that follow suit, um, particularly in, in Drake's uh, case. 
Uh, a lot of these people that you see here are producers or co-writers of his as well. So when he wins, and he's winning to a, you know, a gargantuan effect, uh, all of these co-writers and producers win along with him. So a lot of this revenue that's coming in are through people like Drake and The Weeknd and people that have these collectives and these networks that they employ. And thankfully, they're all Canadian and so can members. Um, you start to see quite a, a, a boost in, in global revenue. And that's, you know, part, you know, it's not Drake alone, but there are uh, plenty of homegrown talent uh, like The Weeknd and Drake, so I Karis, who are, who are kind of driving this, this boom that we're seeing now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's why we, we've had another record year. Uh, but yeah, you can see some of these names here. Uh, Boy Wonder and Forty are pretty close collaborators with Drake. Uh, Carlo um, is is a producer for The Weekend as well. Uh, there's a ton of ex- I'm I'm seeing these here for not the first time, but I'm I'm really seeing a couple names here that I, I glanced over initially that I'm I'm kind of uh, disappointed in myself. And there's some great names here. Obviously, Majid Jordan is a, is a, another songwriter and producer that works under Drake, but now has a, a solo crew. Well, a solo career as part of a group on his own as well. I see Matthew Burnett's name here, who is a, um, a writer, producer, uh, and manager for um, Daniel Caesar, along with Jordan Evans. Um, it's incredible, like what what Canada's doing these days. And um, I think the whole the Drake effect is obviously he he was the one to put Canada on the map, really. Like, and and he's such a support for Toronto, and um, he basically made it uh, made a path for young budding artists and writers and um they they ever you know there's people believe they can do it now and they can so it's amazing yeah i would like <laughs> i would like you were saying that you don't like to use the term trickle effect i would real i would more more so feel comfortable calling it a ripple effect you know you use the one big boulder that created a splash and now there's all these amazing artists and songwriters that are that are doing their own thing as well because of it sold i like that all right um yeah, Daniel, see that I totally, I was think, wondering where uh, Matt Burnett's name was from. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, so here we go. Uh, SoCan's main performance types. Now there's two slides here. Radio is a big one with a few uh, sub entities under it. Um, so in a moment we'll get to live concerts, TV, film, digital, etc. This will answer a number of the other questions that are in the queue from uh, our last question period. Um, but here we go. So underneath radio, uh, DAI, Survey, CBC, I am unfamiliar with uh, what these terms mean and would love a bit of, yeah, help. Can you walk us through these and um, yeah, tell us, especially like how these dollar values and why they're assigned to these different uh, checks? For sure. Uh, so there, there are three forms of, of radio royalties. Uh, DAI is also known as census radio. Uh, we have survey and we have CBC radio. So survey is kind of like the the big commercial stations that that you you hear. Sorry, rather uh, BAI census is is, is the, uh, the the bigger commercial radio stations that you hear. So like the the one two point one the edges, the ninety two point five kits for for Toronto um, uh, attending today. Uh, survey is uh, more for um, like uh, college radio. Uh, more remote radio stations as well. And CBC is obviously, CBC is pretty self-explanatory, but we're talking about, it, for the, for this number in particular, the, the $25 for, for every spin is, is for the, the, um, the federally and nationally uh, broadcasted shows. Um, so the reason why the figures are, are you know, a little bit different is because CBC would have to factor in that there are so many ears listening to these shows. So there's, there's listeners that tune into CBC Radio 2, they're listening to a show, they're listening to a song. We have to factor in that potentially there are, you know, thousands upon thousands of listeners across the country that are listening to this, this particular broadcast. And obviously that contrasts from, from survey, uh, from a college radio station in, you know, Waterloo isn't necessarily getting the same amount of uh, ears that it, the same audience as a, a big show like CBC Radio 2 uh, type of broadcast. And then DAI, uh, a little bit different. Uh, the, com- the commercial radio stations obviously uh, are more local and centralized in, in you know, a, cer- a certain area of, of the provinces. Uh, so we, we factor in those a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just to add a little bit to that, um, uh, these numbers that you're seeing are approximate numbers. Um, 
and, and the reason for that being is it, it will fluctuate quarter to quarter depending on what kind of ad revenue is coming in um, from the station. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to point that out. Gotcha, yeah, and the big okay. thing to note is the big thing to note as well is that census is is being logged consistently. Um, so if if you have a song that plays on on a commercial radio station, chances are we'll have picked up on that. Service a little bit different. Uh, it's audited uh, quarterly, um, so uh, your your uh, your ha your song has to play within a certain window for us to pick it up. Um, and then CDC is very similar. It's always logged as well. Mm -hmm. One thing to add um, for people putting servicing their tracks to radio, um, I would recommend uh, sending it into Nielsen BDS um, uh, SoundScan to get. Um, Basically, it's like a fingerprinting technology. It's free to do. Just type it in Google how to do that, um, and uh, they'll send you uh, a file that has this encoded fingerprint in it. And um, it, it's just a good idea to do in terms of tracking um, when you're getting plays. Right on. Okay. Um, let's see. We got 15 more minutes here. Uh, I don't want to speed through because this is some important stuff, but we do have a few questions to get to. Um, so past radio, concert, we've talked a bit about live performance. Um, yeah, can I leave this one to you guys? Whip us through these uh, other four performance types. Sure. Um, concerts, I always really like to talk about concerts because um, it, it's important, especially for, um, you know, the, the beginner songwriter um, uh, or artist. Um, you generally your first source of income is going to be from concerts um, because it is hard to get played on the radio and and as we all know it's hard to get placed into film and television when you're starting out so um, concerts uh, is something you don't want to miss out on we always want to tell people um, what they need to do in order to get that money so um, it's our job to license um, the promoter um, uh, or the venue if they are the promoter um, and collect the royalties for writers but it's your responsibility to submit your set list so we know what songs are being played um, so this is where the NLMP term comes in that we briefly touched on before. Um, so uh, what you do is you log on to SoCan.ca uh, or .com. We're actually going to be switching over to .com soon, so both work. Um, and you go into SoCan Forms, and then the drop-down menu will show you um, a place to submit your notification of live music performance. Um, so uh, it'll ask you general questions about the show, where the performance took place, the date, you know, the cap and all this stuff and who else is on the bill with you um, and then it's going to ask you to submit a proof your proof of performance so that could be if you have a booking agent an agency contract or it could be um, a screenshot from a Facebook ad um, you know something like that to prove that it happened um, and then our concerts department takes it from there um, and you know generally we know the show happened so we are already on top of licensing it um, but you know there could be maybe smaller shows that, that we hadn't heard about yet and um, so this helps us make sure that we do collect the licensing fee so that the writers can get paid for it. Um, so, yes, I just wanted to point out that you do have to submit your set list in order to get these um, royalties unlocked for you. Um, so if you haven't ever done that and you've been playing a bunch of shows, um, go onto the website and look under Unclaimed Royalties. Um, and this is open for everybody to do. You can type in, type in your, your artist's name or your band name um, and click search. And if somebody else who submitted for the show and you were another act on the bill and they put your name in there, there could be money there waiting for you to collect. So check that out. Okay, uh, so a quick question into that point. How much of that 3% of gross ticket sales, how much of that goes back to the songwriters is the question. Is it all 3% and then divvied up between the number of writers, et cetera? Yeah, so it's, um, so say you're, you're doing a, uh, like a, a two band bill um, and um, the headliner would be getting 90% and the uh, opener, so the support act would be getting 10. So that's usually a split for um, for like a concert. Um, festivals are split up a bit differently, um, but that's generally the rule. And then um, what happens with that amount, so the amount that's allotted to your set, so your band, let's say, um, if you are the only writer on all of the songs that you performed, then you would get 100% of that. Um, but if you were, if you had, you know, maybe somebody else wrote the song with you, then that would get divided up between all of the songwriters on the songs performed. Bingo. Um, 
I've normally saved the questions for the end, but they're very relevant to this one point here. Uh, can you retroactively submit set lists from past performances? And is there a, a time limit or a window on that? There is, yeah. So you can submit for domestic shows um, up to a year back um, from the performance date to, you know, to a, a year ahead of that. Um, and um, for international plays, it's a bit different. We have to follow the guidelines of um, our affiliate bureaus. So um, in, outside of North America, you have three years to submit, so the timeline is a bit longer. And um, for the states, um, depending on which uh, your affiliate you, you've chosen, some of them have a, a deadline uh, as slim as three months. So I recommend that as soon as you get back from a tour, you get within those three months, you submit all of your songs, just get in the habit of doing that, or appoint one band member to do that, or um, maybe ask the tour manager to do that when they're settling out the show um you know just just so it doesn't get forgotten but um yeah so the answer is you have a year for domestic three years for outside of north america and um uh, in certain circumstances you have as little as three months for u.s performances Right on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Jumping into TV film, which I guess we touched on at the beginning. Um, but again, we're talking on the back end here when this media gets replayed. Uh, yeah. Cue Sheets type of music station. Wait, what does that mean? Okay. So Cue Sheets is a composer term. Um, so um, if you are the composer of, of a film, let's say, um, uh, there would be one Cue Sheet submitted for the whole film. Um, and that would ha that would include, you know, 30 seconds of this type of music, maybe 10 seconds of this uh, going into the next scene, it would have, um, you know, a sync in there, like, a, a, and that means, you know, um, a, a band that are a popular band that already has a song out um, that's placed into the film um, and so on. So the two sheet covers all of the music that's happening in that show. Um, and it's the producers of the uh, film in this circumstance um, that would submit that to SOCAN. Um, with all of the different writers that were involved in it. And that's how we get our information on um, what was placed um, on that particular project. Um, so I always recommend that um, if you are composing a film or if you're getting your, uh, your band's music placed onto a television show or something like that, um, always request a copy of the cue sheet just so that you have it and to make sure that it looks right. You know, sometimes things get missed. Um, or maybe the wrong writer uh, gets selected and then, you know, you're not seeing those royalties come in. So um, just have a copy of the cue sheet on hand. And if there's anything, if there's a performance that happens on television, let's say, and you look at your statement nine months later, your SOCAN statement, and you're like, oh, I, I don't see anything coming in from that. Give us a call um, and we'll submit a query. And it's always good to have that cue sheet as a backup. Um, on that note, I uh, this just reminded me to mention, um, I like to re recommend everybody to share their IPI number, which is kind of like your international songwriting number. It's like it's like your SIN number that you want to share with people. It's not a secret. Um, <laughs> that way, if you are writing a song with somebody and you know maybe they're registering it on behalf of both of you, um, there's no way that they're going to choose the wrong person in our database or in the worldwide database for that matter. It's one number that's unique to you all around the world. So, um, you know, they won't choose the wrong John Smith and then that other guy is getting your money. Right on. Um, so yeah, someone was actually asking if SoCan collects uh, royalties from streams, et cetera. Um, here we are. We, we do. As you can see, the numbers are uh, much smaller than uh, our radio and concert uh, revenue streams. Um, as you can see, the, the Spotify and, and YouTube uh, payouts are, are, are quite minuscule. I think that's something that the whole industry is trying to change um, right now, but uh, by no means is the internet your, it, it should not be your main source of income as, as a songwriter. In my opinion. It's just, it's another arm, like you're saying, like with copyright in general, just another way to, to collect your money that, that's owed, but it's by no means the, the most weighted um, uh, source of revenue. Mm -hmm. Right. And in that bundle in your handouts there, there is a feature that breaks down exactly how uh, streaming works, where that money comes from, where it's going. It's about a year old now, so some things may have changed. But what hasn't is that uh, the industry, by and large, uh, knows that, yeah, they're not being compensated properly. And it's something that SOCAN and a number of powerful organizations in the country are lobbying for. Um, 
really quickly here too. Uh, to an earlier question, Dawn says the Copyright Board of Canada lists copyright collective societies on its website. One category is music. You can check this out at www.cb-cda.gc.ca. Thank you very much, Dawn. Um, yeah, let's keep rolling here. Uh, so we talked about a few of these initiatives uh, as far as what the membership and more specifically uh, the a &R division is doing in terms of, well, craft development. You mentioned some of the song camps and master classes, presentations at other events. Um, I guess if we want to give a quick sampling of, of what these are. Actually, no, we'll just leave them on the screen. Is it cool? Unless you guys want to jump in and, uh, and add anything about what's in front of us here, I'm ready to start throwing more questions at you. There are a couple more things to add to this. Um, one thing I want to let you guys know about, uh, well, everything's listed under our member benefits page, so definitely take a look there. Um, in terms of song camps, um, we're running this program called Song Camp Mondays at the Toronto office, and it just started in the Vancouver office, um, and will be starting in the Montreal and LA office once, once that one opens up. Um, and Song Camp Mondays can be applied for under our me member benefits. Um, it's just a uh, fillable form asking general questions about, you know, your strengths and weaknesses and whatnot. Um, and what we do is we curate um, a day of writing between a producer and two top line writers to get in the room and, um, you know, really just work on your craft and meet new people. So I would encourage people to sign up for that. It's been an amazing program, an amazing way to connect with other people if you're looking to expand on that. Um, another thing that I don't think is listed in here is um, we have houses um, that are available for members to um, to book. Uh, we have one in LA, one in Nashville, and one in Paris. Um, and they are available for people who are going there for meetings, like writing trips um, uh, and whatnot. Um, you can apply for those online, take a look at the calendar and see what's booked already. Um, uh, it, is a, it is a very sought after um, benefit for sure so what we do is we we um, take in the submissions and um and the applications and see you know kind of what people have going on while they're out there we want to make sure people aren't just going for vacation and that they have um business plans to be there kind of thing so yeah i just wanted to add that in on top of the other things you have listed i'm really glad you did um yeah that's great so again house nashville uh, can only imagine how much fun that is although you're getting work done as melissa said um all right, so uh, because we've got to cut this off shortly, yeah, we've got about five minutes. Um, there are a few questions left in the queue here. If you've got any that you want to submit, uh, again, aking, A-K-I-N-G, at nor.com. Send them to me, and I'll make sure that they get where they need to be. Uh, so here they are, a few to put in front of you. Um, and oh, this one is interesting. Uh, Hassan is from Pakistan and has been a member of SOCAN since 2014. Is he missing out on any opportunity by not being a Canadian and being an international member and songwriter? No, not at all. Um, anybody can sign up for SOCAN, um, so that's, that's no problem at all. Um, is he living in Canada or outside of Canada right now? Uh, living in Pakistan. Okay. So as long as you have a U.S. or Canadian bank account at the moment, um, we can we can be distributing your royalties um, in either form. So you can get paid out in U.S. dollars or Canadian dollars. Um, and if you don't have either of those, you can still cut a check the manual, old-fashioned way. So no, nope, you're not missing out on anything. Right on. Um, maybe I'm not sure if this is outside your department, but can you let us know anything about SoCan's venture with Clearbox Rights to collect digital royalties worldwide? How far along is that? Mm. You'd have to actually hit up our info center about that. That's not really our area of expertise, unfortunately, to comment on at the moment. Okay, uh, there you go. So you can hit me with that and we'll see if we can uh, find anything out for you from some of the other departments. Uh, Here's a great one. Uh, if someone registered a composition in which I was a co-writer and I don't agree with the percentage of the composition that they provided for me in the SOCAN registration, whether or not there was a split sheet, can and how can SOCAN assist? Yeah, so that, that happens sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, there'll be a discrepancy in different submissions. Um, so your first step will be to send us a note, let us know that there's a discrepancy and we will hold um, we will hold payments, like we'll just freeze it until 
you guys have come to a uh, agreement, um, all parties are happy kind of thing. Um, we don't get involved in, um, you know, any, any uh, chats about it. Um, we wait until we hear what the what the conclusion is from you guys. So, um, but yes, definitely, if there is any anything like this that comes up, let us know so that we can freeze that money. Bang on. Um, and last one here. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I tried to answer Megan's question. It was she's got a song uh, in a video game. How can she make sure that she's collecting royalties? I told her if she's a SoCan member and has registered that song, that they'll be coming to her. But she's asking. Does the video game company need to register? It's a relatively new uh, indie company. Does, does the video game need to register songs? Like, does the so video game so company need to register itself with SoCan in order for music that appears in those games to get to your members? So it depends on what, where the video game is being like. Uh, what platform it's on kind of thing. So it might fall under different categories in terms of like, you know, maybe it's like an online video game kind of thing um, where where it might fall under internet streaming. Um, so, you know what, I the best thing that I would do is uh, I would send in more detail about the specific video game and, and, and the ins and outs, and, you know, what platform it's on to get a better idea of what kind of a license it would fall under. So definitely send in um, a note to members at socan.ca um, and they'll find the answer for that for you. Right on. There you go, Megan, members at SoCan.ca. Uh, thank you very much, Aiden and Melissa. We'll formally thank them in a minute. Uh, musicbooksplus.com slash webinars. Uh, remember, there's some tips there to make the most of, I guess, your next webinar experience, and you can take advantage of that uh, 10% uh, off. And yeah, for the folks that have asked, a recording of the session will be sent out to you 24 hours from now. Uh, you'll be able to share, revisit that as much as you'd like. Um, hit me up with questions. Uh, Aiden, Melissa, there's a ton of thank yous and uh, people singing your praises here, and I'd like to add my voice to that. Thank you to both of you for taking the time and uh, lending us your expertise. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, this was a pleasure. Uh, yeah, so everybody, uh, we appreciate you joining us, and uh, we are signing off here, nwcwebinars.com, to get in on next month's session where we've got producer Kevin Dietz. He's worked with Randy Bachman, Tom Cochran, Alexis on Fire, Protest the Hero. Uh, he's coming to tell us how to make the most of your studio session, whether you're in a major room like Metalworks or the warehouse or recording in your friend's bedroom. Uh, we want to make sure that you're giving the best recordings, totally comfortable, totally confident, nwcwebinars.com. Again, I'm Andrew King, Editor-in-Chief of Canadian Musician, and uh, we're done here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.